Here we are with Brendan Gleeson, one of the world's great actors. Uh, your new movie is The Guard, and uh, I guess everybody knows you as Mad-Eye Moody, <laughs> yeah. the recently deceased Wizard. Mad-Eye. Yes. Yeah, 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 what can I say? You couldn't make it to part two, to the no, very I end. couldn't, just, just a bridge too far. <laughs> what does that do to your career, Brendan, when you're in a incredibly popular series? I mean, do you think, like, of all the work you do, Churchill, The General uh, for John Borman, yeah. uh, this wonderful movie in Bruges, you know, do you think they're only going to remember me for Mad Eye Moody? <laughs> well, it wouldn't be such a bad, uh, it wouldn't be such a bad, um, you know, CV just to have Mad Eye there. But no, Mad Eye, I was very, I was very happy with Mad Eye. Um, I was very happy with the whole setup in Harry Potter because. Uh, the kids were great. They weren't monsters. Um, magic was respected, and uh, the audience was respected. And every, I mean, bringing a little magic into people's lives is no harm. So I'm kind of I'm proud enough of it. But I, you know, I mean, it's really interesting with film. What, what, what you think of as as the really worthwhile projects, and so, quite a lot of the time it has to do with the ones that actually hit the button. Um, you know, some film you, you would think that, oh, well, I, I thought we did well with that, but the audience didn't react to it. Uh, and so and if nobody sees it, it's like it doesn't really exist. Uh, well, exactly. Um, what, there is no point in talking to an empty seat. <laughs> no matter what you're saying or how funny it is yeah. or how profound it is, the empty seat doesn't care. Um, and so you really only, uh, you know, the experience of a film only happens obviously when the audience is in there and it's kind of rocking and they're getting it. So um, it's inevitable, I guess, that the, the ones that are most popular are going to be remembered most. But I would like, I would like some of the other ones to to uh, endure. Well, well, certainly in Bruges. Yes. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. that was a sleeper hit, and people talk about that, and it's what four years ago now. Yeah. I mean, it's a little irritating at times that that when things don't get traction early enough to be seen in theaters uh, because. I, I've had a few films like that that haven't um, gathered momentum and it's gratifying that they have a life on DVD and the way people are watching uh, DVDs now obviously with Blu-ray and everything these little massive screens that people are bringing into home cinema but I still think of the cinema as a communal experience at its best um, and I think it's it's best really seen as, as part of the whole thing um, so while it's gratifying that things have a life I really wish that people would have seen them in the, in the theater. Maybe I want it all, I don't know. Well, you know, it's remarkable about your career when you talk about the things that hit. You didn't start acting until you were, what, 34 years old? Full-time. I mean, I was doing it, but I wasn't full-time. But I was doing it on my own terms. I was teaching school for about 10 years, and prior to that, obviously, college and three years before that that I don't talk about very much because I <laughs> was working in offices and working in all over the place uh, all of which I found quite taxing and uh, <laughs> but I mean and uh, so I, but I was involved with a group called Pash Machine doing theatre which grew very big in Dublin during the 80s uh, and we weren't we weren't professional but we began to work in the professional theatres and get big audiences so by the time I went in 34 I wasn't really starting from scratch if you know what I mean You'd had this experience of working in front of audiences, knowing uh, how to work with directors and, and yes, the yeah. responsibility of carrying a show, I would presume? Absolutely, yeah. And I'd written a few plays myself and directed a few things myself. Um, there was a guy, Paul Mercer, who was at the core of the Passion Machine. I, a lot of his work, Roddy Doyle, the great novelist, wrote a couple of plays. With, he was part of that whole situation. So we ended up playing you know, these 10-week stints, sometimes two or three in a row, of, in the Olympia Theatre, which is 1,300-seater. And So we were actually kind of operating at a pretty high level. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit kind of a, of a cheat to say that I just at thirty four I kind of just jumped ship and started from scratch because uh, that's not quite the case. But it was for a full time as a full time occupation. But it's also remarkable because not every actor hits, no matter what their talent is. I mean, they can be really uh, an amazing actor, but they never get sort of the work to keep working to keep getting called for jobs and you you know from the general i guess that john borman film about was it martin cahill was martin he the Hall, yeah, the ga Hall, the yeah. irish the real life irish gangster you played yes. i mean that launched you internationally but who knew that you would go on to this fabulous career yeah i mean i've always really been an advocate of the work doing the work uh you know, and I got lucky early on. I did a, I did, I played Michael Collins in a television thing called The Treaty, which was a big thing because I had to carry that, and it was of particular significance at home. 
Um, and then, you know, there were different uh, milestones when Braveheart came in in 94. That was a massive thing because, um, you know, it was six months on a, on a massive film set that won five Oscars. You know, it doesn't... So obviously there are things that, you know, happen, but you've got to be ready for them. You know, I mean, when a, a lot of actors talk about the break, the break, the break. I mean, the break for me was the commitment to go full-time. After that, I think you've got to... To not to wait for the phone to ring. I was always prepared to create work if I wasn't offered it. Oh, okay. And uh, and and I kind of I keep telling anybody who's trying to get into this game, don't wait for the break. Make it. Make the break. Well, you have four sons. Yeah. And uh, Dom is it Dom Hall? Donal. Donal. It's the Irish <laughs> spelling of Donal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who was in? Uh, he got to announce your death in uh, Harry <laughs> yes, Potter. He's yeah, in the yeah. movie. Uh, is, yeah. And your youngest one is acting too. Uh, yeah, my third. He's uh, third. Brian. Yeah, Brian. So. So what do you tell them? <clears throat> well, exactly the same thing. Don't wait. Um, you know, just uh, try and get together with a couple of people who maybe somebody you met and you know, some other production or maybe somebody you met at college and, and, and go find, uh, you, you know, Beauty's Cafe and, and put, it, put it on at lunchtime. Do a write something, find something somewhere. Keep find, busy, in other keep, words. Keep busy and make, create the work because when you allow yourself, I mean, the problem is that it's not only your, your talent that's being rejected, it's kind of this, your sense of self that's being assailed all the time if you're allowing other people to set the agenda. So um, I'm a great believer in it. I mean, I was absolutely terrified after my first job. My first job when I went full time was in the Abbey. You know, I had four kids at the time, and I was going kind of. Be, I was beside myself wondering what what I would do next because I wasn't getting offered anything. This was a quite a prominent part and a good show, but where is it happening next? And uh, my wife said, "Look, I can't watch you. I'm going back to work." So that was some that was a ease to my mind. But the next thing I did was a one man show. Somebody said, "Listen, will we?" And myself and uh, Moral Higgins went and did a one-man show. And it was one of the best things that I remember in my whole career because it was equal parts terrifying and liberating. It was wonderful to go out there, not depend on anybody else. Obviously, you know, the back, backstage people and Maura herself. But to be out there in front of an audience and have nowhere to run um, was fantastically liberating. And as I said, really equally terrifying. But that's what I would advocate people to do, you know, that in, in something you will fall at some point. It's whether you're ready for it or not. And, and, and sometimes it only happens and then nothing comes of it. It's just what you learn and what you pick up. I mean, I just am an, an advocate of, of continually do, doing your craft and getting better at it. That's, that's all you can do. And with the guard, um, is it easy? I mean, I understand from John Michael McDonough, who wrote and directed it, uh, and is the older brother of Martin McDonough, mm -hmm. who directed you and wrote in Bruges, that uh, you know you read it and said yes, I'll yeah. commit to doing this. Yes. Now uh, you make a movie possible in one se in that sense. Uh, is it easy for you to say? Do you do you know when you read a script that you want to do I this do, role I, I, and you'll script, commit automatically? Yes, almost. I mean, one thing I can do is read a script. I know that there are actors who can't really read a script and understand where it comes from. I don't know if it's my background or you know the fact that I. I, you taught math? I taught, well, I know I taught English okay. uh, and Irish, believe it or not, in Gaelic. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so I, I maybe was used to having a critical eye on, on things and understanding the dynamic of how things work. I don't know, or else I just understand, particularly when I'm reading a character, whether I'm drawn to it or not. But I think it is something that I'm lucky with, all right, is that I can read a script and understand. Almost invariably, I would know whether this has a real chance or not. Um, and if it's bogus or if it's just incomplete or if it hasn't been worked through, uh, there are alarm bells ringing in my head all the time. Um, and I know that is something that not everybody can do. Um, and sometimes you might get it wrong, but with the McDonald's, I mean, there's no question. You see, you read this stuff, it just bounces off at you. It's like anybody could read that one. Well, your character, uh, Sergeant Jerry Boyle, uh, McDonough said uh, he's an obnoxious cop who will say anything and do anything. And at the very beginning, we see him pop a tab of acid. So my first thought was, you know, what experience did you draw on, Brendan, <laughs> I just, for your acid trip in this movie? Well, without being irreverent, you know, I mean, it always reminded me of, um, of uh, Holy Communion, really. Oh, okay. You 